Well, hopefully you've had a chance to um, look over McNeil's report and you're getting familiar with the computational approaches that are used uh, to compute the apparent conductivity uh, measured using the instruments that operate uh, or that are designed to operate uh, in conditions of low induction number, which we've talked about. And you know that the um, uh, response of a, of a given layer contributes in proportion to the area under the relative response function between Z1 and Z2, for example, uh, where Z is a unitless number. It's the depth to an interface um, divided by the intercoil spacing. So <clears throat> uh, this area then is expressed in terms of the cumulative response function. And so these are things that we're going to discuss in, in more detail later on. But right now we're just going to, you know, just jump into the problem. This is why we're doing it. You know, we want to know what the apparent uh, conductivity uh, is at the surface measured by the instrument and how it's related to conductivities in the subsurface. And we're going to use a simple two-layer problem uh, just just to illustrate how the computations take place. And uh, in this simple two-layer problem, we're going to we have an upper layer that's three meters thick. It has a conductivity of 15 millisiemens per meter. Remember that millisiemens per meter and millimoles per meter are are the same, same units, and <clears throat> that this three meter thick layer sits over top of a layer that has a conductivity of 100 millisiemens per meter. It's our sigma 1 and our sigma 2. And um, so the apparent conductivity that we calculate is equal to, uh, it's kind of a weighted combination of sigma 1 and sigma 2. And the weighting factors are these terms that you see here in parentheses. And notice that we have uh, the cumulative response function r in each one of these terms. And r is simply calculated as the integral of the relative response function from z1 to infinity. So just quickly to coming back here, so we have a, an r1 would be the area from z1 all the way out to infinity. Uh, r2 in this case would be the area from this point all the way out to infinity. So the area that we get here is the difference between those two relative, re, uh, relative response functions. Uh, excuse me, cumulative response functions. So <clears throat> r is easily calculated as 1 over 4 z1 squared plus 1. And uh, so given your z's, you can easily calculate r. And, and again, we're, we're just kind of jumping into the computation. This is the... Um, you know, we'll come back to to the calculations of R and and so on later on. But this is the kind of a problem that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> we we only have one Z in this problem, and so we have two layers. And an easy way to just remind yourself of how many Z's you would have it would be the number of layers two minus one. So we have one z, and we also have only one r. We have one r is a function of z, so if we only have one z, then we can only have one r. In this case, we assume that the uh, third layer is just too deep, or that its conductivity is too low, really, to influence the apparent conductivity that we measure at the surface. So, so we just ignore it. So again, the equation that we're we're using, just to kind of back up a couple, of this, this equation here. We've got these two terms in parentheses. These are just weighting factors. And uh, so you can see this is just a linear combination of the conductivities of these two layers, sigma 1 and sigma 2. Um, they contribute um, uh, in proportion to these weights. And as we've already said, we have one z, and we have one r. So we have these two weights. r is one over the value of z that we get. 
for z squared plus 1. And these would be the two weighting factors, 1 minus r1 and r1. So if you get into Excel, this is uh, an easy, you know, an easy place to come to to make the uh, computation. Uh, I, I always like to do things with pencil first, just to kind of double check, make sure everything is set up correctly. But we've got an inner coil spacing here of 3.67 meters. We've got a depth of three meters. So z is just the depth d divided by the intercoil spacing 3.67 so that gives us a z of, of about 0.82 uh, our r here 1 over 4 z squared plus 1 is 0.52 and it's unitless, unitless. both of these numbers are unitless uh, z is the depth divided by the intercoil spacing you're going to be obviously have to use the same units here so we can't have intercoil spacing in feet and uh, uh, depth in meters we're going to get the wrong answer and we have our two conductivities here. <clears throat> so as a weighted combination, you know, if we come back to our model here, uh, this 100 millisiemen per meter layer is 3 meters beneath the surface, so we expect that the result is going to be higher than the conductivity of the first layer, higher than 15 millisiemens per meter, and it's close to 60. And that's because the second layer is only three meters beneath the surface. So, so the R that we calculate, 0.52, 1 minus 0.522 plus 100 times 0.522, we get this 59. So another point to make when we're doing these calculations, and this is pretty important, is that the way I've calculated this here, I assume that the instrument coils are right on the ground surface. And so underline this or make a note of this. Um, if they aren't, and if you're walking, and you usually would be, you'd be conducting the survey with the EM31 strapped across your shoulder, you'd have probably something about a, like a one meter thick air layer, which would have about a zero conductivity. That would make this a three-layer problem. So, <clears throat> so we have simplified things here by putting the coils on the surface. Okay, a three-layer problem. Um, pretty much the same thing. We're just making we've got more terms to, to work with. Remember, if we've got three layers, then we have two Zs. Uh, we've got three sigmas here. Uh, sigma 1, 15, 2, 15, Z1. And we have two, two cases here that we're going to look at. One where the second layer is just a half a meter thick, and another where the second layer is one meter thick. So that would give us depths of 0.5 and 1 and 1.5 for the depth to the base of layer 2. So again, layer 3 has no Z associated with it. We assume that any layers beneath this layer are far enough away or have low enough conductivity that they really don't influence the measured conductivity at the surface. And again, we are assuming that the coils are sitting right on the ground. Z is equal to zero. OK. <clears throat> So if we go, go through the computations, we have our, and notice that I've, I've, I've been simplifying the notation here, but just to explain what we have here, we have two possible dipole orientations, right? Remember we talked about this before. We can have a vertical dipole, we can have a horizontal dipole. Uh, in our discussions, we're, we're going to be confining our discussions to just computations that involve a vertical dipole, orientation or a horizontal coil orientation. And we have 1 over, so we've got two values of R, an R1 and an R2 for Z1 and a Z2. And uh, our Z1 is 0.5, that would be the thickness of this layer, divided by the intercoil spacing, or just 0.136. So again, Z is dimensionless. And um, <clears throat> 
McNeil again is a good reference for this or for the details. We are going to have two values of R2 and Z2. So our Z1 is 0.136, that would be 0.5 over 3.67. And then we have two values of Z2 uh, for a depth of 1 meter when the thickness is 0.5 meters and for a depth of 1.5 meters when the depth is when the thickness is 1 meter and our z2 z2 is going to be 2.72 and 0.409 so we get this value for r and again I'm simplifying the notation here uh, <clears throat> unless otherwise noted we're assuming that we're using a vertical dipole and um, R1 and R2 just refer to the uh, cumulative response function evaluated at Z1 and Z2. We have two values of Z2, so we have an R of 0.878 and 0.774. And then our three-layer problem has an additional term in here. Now the first and last terms look very familiar. The first term is identical to what it was uh, in the two-layer problem, we just have the weighting factor is 1 minus R1. But notice that the second layer, it's sandwiched in between two layers, so we take R1 minus R2 as the weighting factor here. And then the weighting factor for the bottom layer is always the last cumulative response function <clears throat> by itself. Now, it's important to calculate R1 minus R2. You know when we're calculating derivatives or something like that. It's uh, x2 minus x1 or you know you might think R2 minus R1. That's not going to work because R2 minus R1 is going to give you a negative number. And that's that's a pretty good giveaway that you've ordered these improperly. So I'd suggest, you know, uh, pause the video for a moment, go through these computations. We've got the Z's, we've got the R's. Um, what is the apparent conductivity that you're going to measure here at the surface? And you should find that you're going to get two conductivities uh, for the two conditions, the two um, thicknesses for the layer two that we have. Uh, one of 13.9 where this higher conductivity layer is a half a meter closer to the surface and one of 12.5 where this interface is sitting at 1.5 meters uh, <clears throat> beneath the surface. So intuitively we'd expect to see the uh, second conductivity, the second apparent conductivity is going to be less than the uh, first case for the thinner low conductivity layer. So uh, use your common sense, I guess, when you're looking at these, these problems. And next time, we're going to talk about the relative response function phi and the cumulative response function r in a little bit more detail. And this graphic here just reminds you, um, you know, this is the relative response function for the vertical dipole. And remember, we're, unless otherwise noted, we're talking about vertical dipoles. And this area, as you might have guessed by now, is R1 minus R2. So this area would be the weighting term for that second layer in this three-layer problem, R1 minus R2. Okay, see you next time.